Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Harris uh, from PFP. We're going to talk uh, today. I'm here with Carlos, um, our CTO. We're going to talk a little bit about side channel analysis for critical infrastructure protection. And uh, since we're kind of early and we're starting a little bit early, feel free to interrupt with questions, whatever, as we're going along. Um, and uh, hopefully, this will be an informative session. So. Uh, okay, I'll get closer to the mic. Yeah, okay. I hate standing behind a podium. Normally, I like walk around when I'm talking, so this is going to try. He's going to walk, and I'll talk a little bit, and then we'll switch. Um, do they? Oh, great. They were hot earlier. Yeah, okay. All right, this is a little bit easier for me because I have to pay some uh, little ADHD. So uh, what we're talking about is essentially using, we're trying to take a technology that we basically developed for the uh, US government and US military. And our first commercial targets were um, in the ICS space. And the reason is because it's a similar use case. You have absolutely critical infrastructure that absolutely has to be protected. You have some things that cannot go down and you can't load software on them, and you can't look at the network traffic, and you can't do any of those things because we have a lot of uh, this big divide between the focus of the OT, which is safety and security and availability of the system, and the focus of IT, which is trying to prevent compromises and breaches. And after, so I have a long, weird history. I won't go to the whole thing, but I spent, um, well, I started as an engineer back in the 1990s. I took a detour through the FBI for 11 years as a special agent, working mostly in cyber division and that type of stuff. And then I became a consultant, mostly back to the government, and did a lot of critical infrastructure protection cyber events in an effort to help people talk more intelligently about risk decisions. And uh, IT and OT divide was a big part of my consulting uh, business back in the day because this difference between how people view things. I mean, there's lots of different things you can go into about the psychological differences of how IT folks tend to think abstractly in terms of things like IP addresses and MAC addresses. OT guys tend to think concretely in things like mechanical processes and switches. And all the way through to the difference between a focus heavily on confidentiality and a focus almost entirely on availability and integrity. Right. So can we go to the next one? Next one. There you go. So the problem is, of course, that there's a shared deployment. In the old days, OT and the IT didn't meet. There's OT was on you know, Modbus, serial ports, things like that. And IT was IP address, Ethernet. And they just didn't have a big connection. But now everything, including the Modbus, has gone to Ethernet as well, and there's even you know, wireless products that can be IP based as well. And we have this problem essentially of we have to make some decisions about systems that the folks who traditionally do IT technology don't necessarily understand what the system's doing or how to judge it, the context in which it's operating. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead so, yeah, let me, let me get uh, add to the, the last point that, that uh, Jim was talking about. So there's been a lot of emphasis on using machine learning for security. And one of the main problems we have with machine learning is that, you know, that is the ground truth, which is when you're training your machine learning, you have to make sure what you, whatever you claim is good is actually good, and whatever you claim is malicious is actually malicious. And there is a very blurry line between the two. So having coming up with that ground truth in the first place is very, very difficult. And the last one, when we talk about the endpoint paradox, is that most of the endpoint protection relies on actually installing agents on the devices themselves. And of course, that you, know, you, you need that endpoint information for context. If you're just looking at the network and you see a packet going through, you don't know if, what you don't know what it did. You know, did it deploy? Did it do something back to it? You don't know. You need to you need to have that endpoint context to really understand what's going on with your network, with your whole system. But in order to get that context, you need usually you need to install an agent in the endpoint itself, which means that it's a little bit like asking you know the fox how many chickens are in the hen house, because the moment somebody compromises that endpoint, 
you know, that they can make the agent lie to you. So we, we have that, that paradox that we call it because you need to rely on the endpoint, but you cannot trust it. All right, so a lot of the things that people do today, which are trying to separate the systems from the internet, good, patching, good, but difficult if you've separated the system from the internet. Um, using these kind of traditional IT systems, they're all you know, things that are necessary, but not complete, right? They don't actually solve the essential problem. Um, they also don't necessarily solve the fundamental insider problem that everybody kind of understands they now face. Um, with this, uh, you know, sorry, sorry, uh, let me let yeah. point over back to Carlos because there was something about the, um, right. the limited operations I didn't, that he put on here I wasn't sure about. Right, yeah, so like, like Jim said, IT and OT are very different. Most of the time, uh, when you talk about security, you bring the things that we learn in the IT world, we try to jam them into the OT world, and they're very different worlds. There's one quick example that you know, for Windows updates, the best time to do it is on a Sunday at 2 a.m. in the morning when it's not disrupting anybody. That would be the absolute worst time to do it in an OT system, because if something goes wrong, you want to have everybody looking at it so they can take action. So they're very, very different. And, and when you try to jam the security solutions from IT into the OT, you leave some systems vulnerable because not all of them can be deployed. So uh, you have, in addition to that, the, a lot of the operational requirements that are very strict and very different from OT systems. You have embedded systems, you have legacy devices, you have a broad variety of, of platforms that have to interact and, and where reliability is king. So it makes it really difficult to use the, the, the things that we have learned in, in, the, in the IT world to directly just apply them in the, in the OT. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what we're trying to say in this world. Yeah, and to that end, I kind of remembered, I sort of blanked there for a second, but I had a <clears throat> an interesting two different in consulting engagements, and of course I can't mention the companies involved, but both of them were utilities. And one of the utility proudly said, we solve all of our problems with air gaps, and then they went on to describe it. I said, okay, so it's truly air gapped, and they said, yeah, absolutely air gapped, this is a power supply system. I said, okay, so your billing of the energy Right? How does that get to your, your billing department? They said, oh, well, it just you know, goes through the firewall and the MPLS to the business system. So I'm like, but that's not an air gap. No, it's like an air gap. <laughs> but it's not an air gap. And uh, it was just kind of funny that we, as we were having this discussion, they, they really genuinely, truly thought they had air gapped the system by putting a firewall and MPLS through the firewall. I had another company that really, truly, they were, as far as I could tell, air-gapped, right? They had completely severed any IP connection into the system. Cool. How do you update the firmware? Oh, we go over to the internet machine, download the firmware, put it on a thumb drive, walk over to the machine, and load it. Okay, technically an air-gap, but obviously another vector. And since they had no other software on the system to protect it, or any other device to protect it, because, hey, we're air-gapped, what could possibly go wrong? They were doing that, which post Stuxnet, everybody knows, doesn't work. So what we're looking at instead is something a little bit different. So the challenge here, of course, is to put something that doesn't require loading software, uh, interrupting the network, or it could possibly become a point of failure for the entire system. So PFPs, uh, wait, what we've been researching and, and doing for quite some time in the government space is looking at side channel analysis. Now, Everybody in the conference has probably heard somebody talk about side channel analysis, talking about reading RSA keys or breaking or doing bad things to a system, but we're kind of the other side of this, which is we want to use the same process. We want to look at tiny fluctuations on either the power or the EM emissions to determine what the state of the system is, if it's in a known good state, a known bad state, or an unknown state, which in this type of application should be considered bad. So if you think about the power plane inside of an electrical device, right, like our badges and everything like that, each time a processor, microcontroller, whatever, has to make an operation, has to do something at a clock cycle, even if it's negligible, it has to reach in that power plane, it has to pull some power out. 
So if you think about that as a very still, crystal still lake, right? Like Lake Tahoe in the summer, you know? Looks really clear, you almost don't wanna touch it because as soon as you touch it, you know you're gonna create ripples. Those ripples are gonna go on smaller and smaller, but indefinitely. If you think about a deterministic process like an industrial control system, reaching in, dipping into that power plane over and over again, it creates very patternist, patternistic is not a word, I'm sure, but <laughs> deterministic patterns of waves on that plane. So we're using, usually in EM in these cases, and we'll talk about why, we're using that along with some signal processing and machine learning to basically identify in time and frequency space, what are those things that are important between the different operating states? And then outputting a statistical fit of what state you're in, the machine thinks you're in, and how confident it is in that state. Is there anything you wanted to add? No, no, that's, that's really it. No, there's a lot of signal processing involved, so when we, we start talking to people about you know, side channels and, and you know, transforms and wavelet transforms and things like that, often they don't, the, the traditional cyber people, they have a little hard time wrapping their heads around it, but in principle, it's very, very straightforward. You know, when you have a digital device, you're flipping bits from one to zero to, zero to one, and the more bits they flip in every clock cycle, the more energy you need to flip those bits. So as you're executing your logic, you're flipping more or less bits that give you this very tiny but very unique pattern that depends on both the hardware and the software. And that's the one we're going. The, the, the people doing such channel attacks, they go after that to steal information. We're flipping it around and we're using it to make sure that nobody has modified the logic in your device. Man. Oh yeah, this is the slide. The next slide, uh, you will see in a minute, is one that for some reason takes a long time to load on this computer. <laughs> but uh, let me talk about it a little bit uh, while, while this one loads. Oh yeah, sure. On the slide here, uh, you, had, you had signal processing going to training. Talk a little bit about the training. So the training right now, and actually the, our current setup is actually based, so I should probably let him talk about it more. But, uh, the machine learning training, we got a couple of different paths. One is the original um, machine learning algorithms that Carlos, uh, as part of his PhD work, uh, developed some time back. And that has been developed into what we're currently using. I'm also doing some work now in deep learning convolutional neural networks uh, to do the same thing. So less signal processing up front, uh, more deep learning, which obviously takes more processing power, but can um, get better separation in some odd cases, some you know, difficult cases, uh, but that's still kind of under development. Um, but Carlos can talk more about the, uh, his yeah. work, because he yeah. had Yeah, so, so this was, my background is in wireless communications. I used to work with software-defined radius, and the, the, the origin of the technology, it was looking at how to help regulatory bodies certify software-defined radios and enforce those certifications. Uh, when the FCC tests a, a new radio and puts a stamp of approval that can be sold, they, they certify a specific hardware with a specific software. It's a pair. And if you change either one of them, you have to go getting retested to get recertified. But they never said how they were going to enforce that. So that was part of the, the work that we were doing in figuring out how can we help, how can we detect that either one of them has changed. Of course, we look at such channels, they worked, and, and the application for cybersecurity was you know, straightforward. In terms of the training, we have a battery, like Jim was saying, we have a battery of different um, machine learning algorithms, and, and they go from the traditional, the, uh, the support vector machines, you know, random forests, uh, just Bayes uh, classifiers, and we're doing a lot of work lately with, with deep learning, and just giving really good results. And all of them work in, in, in different cases, so we have a battery of them, we do a lot of feature extraction ahead of time, a lot of signal processing to clean the signals, synchronize them, and, and, and clean them up, and then you know, we pass them to the classifiers. Yeah, a lot of our work is part of a, a DARPA project on using AI to classify signals in different areas has fed this. So we're kind of finding what are the best things to work on different use cases. Because different machine models have different accuracies depending upon the signal, you know, different parts of the signal. In fact, we still don't fundamentally understand why some things work better. And that's part of what we're doing now as fundamental research is can we figure out why certain machine learning algorithms work better on certain types of signals and not on others. And, you know, that's, there's still a lot of fundamental questions to be answered about that. 
So when Tom finally loaded the, the slide, and, and one of the things that when we tell people that we look at side channels, usually a PFP stands for power fingerprinting. We often look at power consumption of the devices. People often think, oh, let me see the, the level of power in my, in my, my cell phone, uh, like the battery indicator. And, and that's, that's not what we look at. We look at tiny, tiny patterns. Um, this is what they look like. That's one of the traces from a PLC, actually. This is what they actually look like. And, and if you see the picture of the, of the chip, the, the, the emissions radiating directly from the, from the silicon. This is part of the fundamental physics of the semiconductors. So they, as you're moving electrons around, they generate those fields. And, and we're the ones, those are the ones we'll be picking up. Because we tell people often, oh, we're looking at power. How are you looking at how much? You know, what if I turn my, what if I turn my, batter, my, my, my screen on? Or what if I turn a fan? This is going to mess you up. No, we're looking at the, the emissions directly from the processor that it's you know, executing your logic. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different concept. No packets, no uh, system calls. Uh, yeah. And one of the things about... Uh, this part right here. So if you go see our demo in the next area, you'll see that we have a very tiny little loop antenna. That little loop antenna is mostly going to pick up, because a question commonly comes up, uh, well, isn't that subject to a whole lot of noise? But the type of probe that you'll see there is mostly picking up the magnetic component of the, of the EM emissions, right? So it doesn't, that drops off very rapidly uh, with distance. So it's much you know, more accurate when we use the EM. We also have a, some demos where there were uh, some installed on the wall where you see it's using DC power, which is also pretty good. Um, not always in an ICS if it's end line because then potentially we could become a point of failure for the system. But the EM is really, really good and works well in a noisy environment because we're mostly measuring that the, B com the magnetic field component of the EM field. And so, so we, we talked already about side channel uh, uh, attacks, and the Tempest, you probably guys are familiar with, the Tempest was designed specifically uh, for those side channels. So when we, we, you know, if you're familiar with those, you know, you know that they have been used for decades to extract that information, which is using it in a slightly different way. And if you see the racks and stuff that goes in there, for a Tempest system, that's what you have to do to prevent those signals from leaking out. Uh, go ahead. What if somebody brings a strong magnet around that? Like, what would your response be, or what would you do? I mean, obviously, that would, your signal would be completely screwed up, so you'd know something was going on. Right. Whether it's, whether it's malicious or, you know, whether it's malicious or not. Or, you know, like, that's right. So, so basically, that would be the, the case of jamming, right? If, if somebody would be jamming you with a, with a, with a magnet, uh, or with what, anything else. So we, you would see it. You would see, oh, there's, there's this big jam. And, and we will flag it, and somebody would have to go look at it. But it would be very obvious that you're being jammed well, in, in the signal. I mean, somebody could literally just work with magnets, and say NDT or something, and they're working. You know, they could you know, use magnets. That, that's true. That's true. They, they could be just working with magnets. Um, I'm sure Right, it, it is possible, but it's very unlikely. So we actually were doing some tests in a, in a substation. They have these big, massive, massive transformers right next to it. And, and you can see that you know, there's this huge electromagnetic fields around it. And they actually, when you go there, they, they ask you, they, no, they, metal. You, no metal, you have, to, you have to put your suit to, to, to be able to get there, and, and this one works just fine. Because you know, at, at that point, it becomes, um, uh, you increase a little bit the noise and, and the, the, the and uh, the signals come at different spectral bands, so you can filter those fairly easily. And, and if, somebody, say, if somebody were going to be playing with a magnet right next to your device and doing this like, you know, at, at several kilohertz moving it, well, that could probably you know, impact us, but very unlikely. Yeah, a static magnet, the, the delta of the, or the change from moment to moment of the magnetic field isn't going to really register, it's the delta. So if like, you're moving the magnet rapidly in and out, if you do it you know, 10,000 times a second, then it would definitely make a field. And a lot of the magnetic fields we would be around might be static. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, exactly. It, it is potentially there. That's part of the reason when you're doing the baseline of the machine learning, you should do it in, as much as possible in the environment in which it's going to be deployed. So as close to that environment as possible so that the machine can already learn what the ambient noise that it might pick up looks like. 
Uh, integrity assessments, again, what we're essentially doing is trying to look at, once we have built a model of it, um, we're looking through those side channel patterns. We have our baseline. We measure distance from the baseline to what we're seeing right now and then give you a confidence level out of this is the state I'm in. This is my confidence level. If the confidence level gets too far outside of what is acceptable, then and it doesn't match any other state, then it's an anomaly. And I don't know what it is, I can't help you figure that out, but I can absolutely tell you that it's not operating exactly the same way. Could be because of an electrical failure, could be because somebody's doing something with electromagnetic fields nearby. I don't know what it is, I just know I'm not in the right operating condition that you expect me to be in. Okay. This one I have to turn it yeah, back, Carlos. So there's two ways in which we normally do, do the training. The way that we prefer uh, that we prefer is when we do the supervised learning, and which means is that you grab your device that you're going to be monitoring, and you bring it to your test and evaluation room, and you make it go through all of the different paces, all the different go through all the different states. This is the exact same type of uh, uh, assessment that you would do to do code coverage on your traditional functional tests. So you want to you want to exercise all the different paths. Doesn't mean you have to exercise all the different inputs. You have to exercise all the different execution paths, and that way you can come up with a complete, you know, a, a library of what the, the normal the uh, the real states are. And then if anything were to come in, we will we will flag it. Of course, that requires you to have a test and evaluation room, and then you can able to monitor. Uh, the, the, for the, the execution of different states. Uh, the other one is unsupervised learning, where you simply observe the device for a period of time, and whatever you observe in that time, you make it, you make it part of your library, and uh, you, they might, anything you don't see, you can match it, you flag it, but in that case, we can have more false positives, uh, because uh, you know, we haven't seen all the states. And, and people, often, people often ask us, well, how about complex flat platforms? You, know, you have a really, really, you know, complex device and PLCs are actually fairly complex. And what we tell them is we limit the scope of those. We either uh, force them to execute a specific task and we make sure that that task hasn't been compromised, or we go low level, make sure that the firmware and, and the initial execution, the BIOS, hasn't been tampered with. So let me go to the next one. So one of the, the things people ask about the performance is how well it does. Uh, this is one of the early work we did with DARPA. And it shows the ROC, Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve. Basically, it's a, you know, how good a detector is, a, how well a detector works. And uh, so vertical axis is probably a detection. When you have an anomaly, uh, something else, you, you detect it. Versus a false positive, which is when you have a real, uh, a legitimate event that you mistake and flag it as, a, as an anomaly. And in this case, you see that for you know, the blue line, for over 80% prob probability of detection, you have a 10 to the minus 15 uh, false positive rate. And the reason why we can do that, you see the three lines, is because you, 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 well, with PFP, it works differently. If you were to send a, a file to VirusTotal and, and get your assessment, it will tell you malicious, not malicious, whatever. Uh, if you send the same packet a thousand times, or so the same uh, file a thousand times, you get the same answer a thousand times. With PFP, you observe one execution instance, and you give you an assessment, which is a black line. If you, you can observe another execution instance of the same you know, code, you can put them together and, and start integrating the noise out, so you get a cleaner signal. The more you observe, the cleaner the signal it gets. So that's where we can come up with this such low probability of false positives. Um, works differently. Okay. <laughs> so, and one of the reasons people doing assessment using side channels, integrity assessments using side channels, is much harder than just asking the device, hey, you know, are you okay? But there's a lot of advantages of doing it this way. And the main one is that we do no harm. So, normally, like we've talked before, we have that line between the OT and the IT, the safety critical side. You have to make sure you do no harm to those systems. And with PFP, because you can be physically uh, separated from them, you can physically air gap from it, you guarantee you do no harm. Um, there's no latency or reliability impact on your network or on your device itself. And you're literally just putting a probe right next to it. Uh, you can, because we look at them as just signals, we don't care what the, the, the box that generated them did. So we look at them as black boxes. Uh, you can support embedded legacy devices, can be real-time systems, um, and we add no latency to them. So there's no need to recertification. A lot of 
critical infrastructure plants, they have to be go through a very rigorous certification process to make sure that they don't, you know, explode and kill people. Uh, so do, every time you're going to introduce a change in, in any of those systems, it can be very expensive to go, go through do the whole recertification with BFP. Since you're not changing any of that by using side channels, and you're not changing any of the system, you avoid all that uh, complex process. And um, very importantly, it does not introduce additional vulnerabilities. Something like 30% or attack vectors, don't remember the actual numbers, come from actually you know, security solutions. With PFP, again, you are separated from it, so you introduce no additional you know, vulnerabilities to your system. Um, and you can detect the test very quickly. And the last one that we have here is very robust against evasion. Technically, it's possible for somebody to generate a sequence of code that matches perfectly what the other code was doing, but it's very, very difficult. Technically possible, but it's very, very difficult. And also covers accidental faults, so if for some reason you have this gamma ray that hits your system and it starts misbehaving, we will catch that as well. And, and it's not a malicious attack, but it's, it's something that you need to know because you're dealing with critical infrastructure. Um, it integrates with uh, any other solutions, so you, can, you don't have to modify any of your system, including your security solutions that you have in place. You can have your access controls, you can have firewalls, anything else you want. We just put an additional layer of protection. And because we're air gap from it, if you compromise the device, the target device that we're monitoring, you cannot get from there to us. And if you compromise us, you cannot get to them. Yeah, and again, to this point about adding a layer. So we're obviously not sitting here saying that, you know, this is the only way you should monitor the device. There are lots of other things you should be doing. This is just an additional checkpoint. I mean, when you get to the idea of uh, what we can detect, again, at the end of the day, if the function gets weird, which could be because it's failing or could be because somebody's attacking it, all we can tell you is that it's weird. We can't tell you that it's, you know, malicious or we can't, you know, in some limited circumstances with other types of devices, we have categorized things like Mirai on, on uh, cameras and things like that, so we have known bad states that we can characterize, but there's too many of those, and there's enough people in that area doing that type of stuff. We, we focus more on making sure that the hardware is what you expect it to be. So, this time, okay. Well, this was a very interesting live, but we spent too much time at the beginning, so we'll <laughs> keep it. <laughs> Let's just wrap it up. Um, there's DARPA project that is funding us uh, to do this work. And uh, there's basically two deployment options. You can deploy the technology runtime, or you can deploy the technology as a, as a screening. So if you create an infrastructure, you want to make sure that your devices haven't been, the hardware hasn't been compromised. You can tailor the tools to do that. Or you want to make sure continuous monitoring. And when we say continuous, you know, we really mean 24-7 you know, every second, making sure that the, the execution of your system hasn't been compromised. So we have those two deployment options. Uh, we've done tests with PLCs. You can come to our uh, next door to your demo. We've done tests with Cisco routers, network infrastructure, a number of platforms. So with that, I'll let Jim you know, wrap it up. Yeah, so again, uh, we'll wrap up quickly. We don't want to go over time and uh, you know, respectful of the next speakers that are going up. But Please come see it. Uh, think about this and other applications of this. We're still, you know, kind of in that transition stage between research and government and DOD research and um, like practical applications. So love to hear your ideas, thoughts you might have on it, and uh, look forward to talking to all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you.